Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome here to this uh, uh, company event of uh, Spin360. Um, I'm very glad to have uh, all of you here. Some of you may have seen part of this presentation uh, earlier this morning during uh, an event we held uh, uh, here in cooperation with Lina Pelle. So the topic of today is uh, uh, life cycle assessment of ladder and um, why we think, uh, um, first of all, why we think the topic of life cycle assessment is ended as such. The new words is life cycle thinking. So using the numbers or the perspectives from an NLCA standpoint to look forward, to look for improvement actions. So uh, as I said, where shall I point it? Dove la devo puntare? Okay, devo solo schiacciare l'altro. So. <laughs> A little bit of science, exactly. <laughs> so, um, um, I just wanted to introduce this whole uh, uh, idea and concept, uh, starting from some evidence that is coming out of uh, the scientific approach that is leading us here. Um, this is the curve of uh, the growth uh, of uh, uh, world population. So we're speaking about a situation in which uh, in uh, 2020, uh, more or less, uh, we're about to be 8 billion people. This number is expected to be growing up to uh, 10 or 11, up to 2050 and 100. Uh, with a growth rate that is actually decreasing in these years, but it, it doesn't matter if the growth rate is decreasing, the population is growing as such. Um, this means that we have less planet pro capita. Uh, I think this is basically evident. The Earth is not changing, but the number of people is growing, so that uh, the, the Earth that is available for each one of us is shrinking from uh, almost eight acres, uh, that is uh, the, early, uh, the early years of last century, down to 1.6 in 2050. So the unavailability of land means uh, a shrinking set of resources for each of us, uh, as individuals, companies, businesses, whatever. Um, this is one of the main reasons why the circular economy concept is being pushed so much because going on in a growth rate like the one we have with the linear model uh, will not be uh, sufficient using uh, the only planet we have. Uh, just um, as an example, uh, uh, since we have twice as much the time as we had this morning, I can speak a little bit more. We, everybody is speaking about electric cars. No? So electric cars, for example, the amount of lithium that is available worldwide is not enough to make the whole set of cars that are circulating today electric. So just to give you an idea of what is one of the burdens we're talking about, the availability of resources. Uh, this is a, instead a graph in which uh, we have the CO2 emissions the, 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 black dot, the black line and the concentration of CO2. And what is very interesting to see is that the behavior of these two looks very similar. If I would have someone better than me, like Federica, for example, in doing the graphs, I could have overlapped the two and we could have seen that the behavior is very, very similar. What does it mean? It means that uh, it, it can be interpreted as an evidence that this, the increase of CO2 is anthropogenic. It's our fault. It's not uh, whatever, gl a glacial area. Is, uh, it's really, it looks like uh, it's, it's coming from the human activities. Um, so these are among a set of problems uh, that we have to face. I can go on with the water scarcity, I can go on with the eutrophication of uh, uh, fresh water uh, inlands, I could go on with microplastics worldwide. The point here is that the science is providing evidence that there is a need for action. Hmm? Um, over the past 25 years, this has become clearer and clearer 
but the 25 past years have not been accompanied by a structural evolution of legislation. So what has happened since the issuing of ISO 14001 was a request for businesses and a call for action to businesses and the private sector to act on the basis of volunteering, uh, on the, to volunteer improving. Okay. And this is leading to the situation which we are now. When I project this slide, I always say, I know you don't read it, don't worry, just to say that 163 out of the top 500 fortune companies have made commitments towards carbon neutrality. So this is again something that is a trend. The businesses are keeping on committing, starting from large corporations. But today, the legislation is moving forward very fast to fill the gap where it has been until now. Uh, I see some people in the room, Francesco, for example, there in the back. But when we were auditors of the ISO 14001, the legislation was telling you to, to check the limits at your site. Here we're speaking about the Competition and Market Authority of the United Kingdom banning greenwashing. Uh, and we're speaking about uh, the uh, uh, Commission staff working document as a proposal of a directive European directive for better protection against unfair practices and better information is an anti-greenwashing directive. What is, which are these things? What is highlighted here? Green claims should be a, must consider the full life cycle of a product. This I told this this morning also, but there is a large corporation that has been fined. Actually, they have called it what is a, a compulsory contribution of 400,000 euros because of the misuse of the word sustainable to describe some of their products. Okay, so some time ago, the legislation was, hey, go and check the water quality at your point. Now we're speaking about how you communicate sustainability towards consumers in a little bit different approach. Um, at the same point, at the same time, um, the number of uh, certifications, labels, whatever, that are claiming uh, to be supportive of sustainability is booming. 465 uh, accounts for in ecolabelindex.org. Eco so as I, I always say, having 465 ecolabels means to have zero, no? because it's not, none of them has enough strength to be widely accepted worldwide. Um, and this is in line with the, growth, the, the birth of the concept of sustainability, 1987. Two very important things happened in 87. One, Brundtland, Gro Harlem Brundtland, no, the prime minister of the, of the Norwegian prime minister, presented um, the, our common future, the report at the United Nations. Second, the first episode of The Simpsons. So this is the Simpsons, no? the Simpsons, uh, 1987. So this is the second, uh, nine years after the first certification, ISO 14001 Environmental Management System. ISO is starting doing some standardization on the environment. Since then, 465. Incredible. Product level, system level, uh, biodegradability, whatever. You name it, there is a certification for that. So I think that uh, we think at SPIN that there is a need for a new approach, what we call an elegant simplicity, uh, not to be simplistic, but we are trying to manage a complex issue in a simple way. And this is why we rely on data. This is the only thing we want to do. I say uh, we present ourselves, if you come in our booth at uh, Pavilion 9, that we are a factory. Uh, yes, we are a factory, but we do, we collect, uh, analyze, elaborate, interpret data. So this is what we do. We just analyze data. We are a factory of sustainable innovation because we are data driven and we are basing our decisions, everything on, on numbers and data. Um, okay, so one, since we're at Lina Pelle, we'll just be focusing on the letter LCA. Uh, we have a lot of experience on that, so we have studied 368 leather products, so it's a huge number. 
um, that is allowing already us to do some uh, uh, data analytics. So this is the next step we're doing. We have uh, luckily some uh, fresh and talented uh, uh, people joining uh, our team doing uh, proper, very well data analytics. And um, uh, this is the next step of what we want to do, no? to be more and more intelligent deriving from data in explaining uh, the next steps. This 368 leather products involved 148 plants. Unfortunately, this is not the number of our customers. It's the number of plants that are involved with the supply chains of these products in 20 countries in which we find tanning operations. We are excluding from this counting the number of countries from which the raw materials are coming from. Um, so how does an improvement roadmap look like? Since we said uh, we are basing our discussions, we look forward, no, we just don't look at the number. So the first key point is uh, the, what we call a life cycle assessment, uh, as it properly is. Then uh, we're working very much in uh, uh, life cycle costing as well. So uh, a life cycle assessment data structure looks very much like a structure of industrial accounting. If instead of CO2, you have uh, um, uh, euros per unit uh, with the same data structure, you do environmental accounting and, uh, and, uh, and money, apart from personnel and uh, uh, depreciation of equipment. L'ammortamento dei macchinari e il personale, they do not take into account, uh, they're not taking into account into, into LCA. Then uh, once these two things are properly integrated or even focusing on, uh, on uh, environmental data, the next step is to define and implement a data-driven uh, reduction strategy. And only when uh, uh, improvement is not possible anymore at that level of technology, then it's the moment to compensate. So this is really some key, some key milestones uh, for, for uh, a strategy. Then, something that uh, we have been discussing this morning and we, have been, we will discuss also this afternoon and tomorrow at the Leather Working Group uh, conference, which I'm honored to be a speaker of, is the raw hide dilemma. So the dilemma is, there are basically three elements. One is, what is the environmental footprint of animal farming? The second question is, do we have to take into account some of the environmental footprint of animal farming into the one of leather? If yes, how? If yes, how much? Oh, so these are some unsolved questions. Actually, there are some solved questions that are saying uh, that there are some default allocation factors to be used. But the point here being, uh, there is still a huge lack of proper data on what is an actual, real environmental footprint of animal rearing. So if I have to express my opinion, it, it is, uh, should there be a portion of uh, the growth of the animal that is taken into account in leather? My opinion is yes, uh, there should be some part. Uh, how to calculate it? Uh, yeah, we, probably this mass fraction and economic allocation are good ways of doing that, but the point here is we need to build intelligence. If we don't have enough data, then all of the other um, considerations are just a waste of time. Um, today, with the figures we have, uh, meat is thought to have 32 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilo. Okay. Just to give you an idea, um, I lost 15 kilos in the past year, uh, not because uh, I wanted to be more beautiful, but because I wanted to reduce my footprint. <laughs> because if you go and come back by plane in the United States, you normally produce three tons of CO2. Okay. So three tons of CO2 is one uh, return trip to US, one person. I'm joking, uh, I didn't lose uh, 15 kilos, but, uh, <laughs> but, but it's, this is the kind of numbers we're talking about. So we're, we're discussing, uh, we have people that are really not can, capable of understanding these things, and we're debating on this kilo, one kilo more, or one kilo two on a material, and uh, then they do product development and they have uh, samples flying around the world all the time. So do you understand, the, the importance of number is incredible. 
numbers. Um, so one uh, return trip to the US is, uh, I don't know how many square meters of leather finished. Um, within this number of uh, what is the impact of uh, a square meter of leather, there are some hotspots, which we know for sure that they are. One is, yes, the, the rawhides, the raw materials that are not deriving from uh, uh, the, what we call the core processes, so the processes that are carried out in a tannery. But then uh, if we speak about what happens in a tannery, we see that chemistry plays an enormous role. A second most important impact factor is chemistry. So one funny thing is that when you look at things from a life cycle assessment perspective, and then you look at all the different square meters of solar panels that have been built on the top of factories, and you see that electricity accounts for 3% of the total, then you're like, mm, no, there must have been something wrong. Because it's really, it's a different perspective. Before, people were looking at, at the site level. So yeah, build your own energy is nice, is okay. I'm not saying that solar energy is wrong, absolutely. No, I'm, this is, but if there is a priority of investment in case of a tannery, mm, that doesn't make sense to invest millions in that. There are some other cases for more energy intensive companies uh, in which uh, to turn, uh, and we have one in the room, in which to turn to a good production of, of thermal and electricity, it makes a lot of sense. But this is not the case uh, for a tunnel in which the highest temperature we get is 60 degrees in post tunneling. So this is a little bit more uh, in, in details. Uh, if we look only, this is an example of uh, uh, Vilskin's uh, production in which 45 to 60 percent is raw material, 50 to 40 percent is instead uh, uh, core, and then the core is divided uh, here like that. So one other thing is that we, you can see that we're speaking about allocated water. First of all, why allocated water and not just water? Because in the tannery there are many products that are realized at the same time. Mm? And the more the tanner is good at making what we call co-production, the less is the impact of leather. If in the first phases there is a production of collagen, gelatin, uh, whatever, with the scraps that are produced in the early phases, this, the impact from upstream are going and following those production. Okay, so this is why we speak about allocated water. And we see that here, the allocated water counts for 0, 0.00 whatever percent. Why? Because we're speaking only about global warming potential. This is carbon footprint. Another action point is that the world is speaking about carbon footprint. Is that enough? No. It's not enough. It's only one dimension. If we look at that only by this dimension, then we will disregard water. And <laughs> it doesn't make sense, does it? So there should be also an integrated approach in looking at different environmental impacts. But uh, in any case, global warming is a good guide because if I implement some key actions, such as, for example, doing uh, uh, efficiency, efficiency is expected to have a good uh, effect also on many other parameters. But in general, we see post tanning as a key uh, phase, uh, the bee mouse as well, but mostly for uh, waste produced. So there is still a lot to do to create co-products instead of waste in the first phases. And if we look uh, in general by row, chemistry is number one in core, uh, electric energy is 10, transport is 15, and waste is 12. Okay, so this is of course one case, and it all depends on what is uh, also the supply chain uh, configuration. I don't know who of you is familiar with the HIG index, but uh, the title of this slide is uh, Are All Environmental Metrics Rightly Guiding Choices? Question mark. And this question mark is very big. Because if you look at this, I am glad that you can't read, but please have a look at this. This is silk. So the HIG index is saying that silk has, I don't know how many uh, times, more impact than polypropylene. Why? Because HIG, as many other aggregated indicators, is following a political choice. 
That is, whenever you find one unique indicator, you need to think how it has been created. So this is created by multiplying the life cycle assessment results times, times some normalization factors. I cannot be super precise, but I know that the kind of normalization factor that is behind this for eutrophication, who of you knows what eutrophication is? Okay, eutrophication basically is when the algae are growing because there is a lot of organic matter in water. Do you think uh, polypropylene creates eutrophication? No, it doesn't because, because algae cannot grow on oil-based materials. The oil-based materials are killing uh, algae. They're not making them grow. Do you think uh, someone that has to do with a live matter than for plants that needs fertilizer have a high or a low eutrophication? they have a high eutrophication. So if you create a normalization factor in which the factor for a parameter such as eutrophication is 1,000 times higher than the one from global warming, then you're making a political choice. You want to favor synthetics. No? So I am just saying it very clearly. I will take responsibility of what I say, but I think that uh, this is clear to everybody. So. I am not blaming Hig by far. I'm just saying that normalization is dangerous. Um, this is how we work, uh, and we call it the data-driven pathway. So basically what we do is we define and characterize supply chains. We characterize uh, materials, transport, and factories. Then in the factories, we put the different machinery and processes. And then we obtain what we call the environmental indicators. How many kilowatt hours, how many liters of water. From this, we get the uh, impact indicators. And we use this to uh, what we call a hotspot analysis, the identification of priorities, and the simulation of a data-driven improvement pathway. Um, when we speak about integrating economic variables to environmental impacts, uh, this is a screenshot from a freshly re released, apart from uh, uh, a little bit of uh, uh, bad visualization. If uh, we work on a process, so if you come to our booth, you will find that we have a huge drum there in which we have integrated a, a program. This program is basically doing all the measurements of the processes that are happening in the drum. So we're able to understand which are the process criteria the dosages of water, the number of chemicals, the chemical dosage, the total running time of the machine, as well as what has been the single water consumption, kilowatt hours per square meter of thermal energy. And to this, we have a full set of environmental impacts, but also economics. This is meant to guide companies towards improvement. And the objective of this is to empower reduction. So the key point uh, here in, in this few time, we cannot go into detail, but the key points to implement a, a successful uh, impact reduction strategy is to focus on three elements. One is what we call do with less, so reach the same objective using less resources. The second one is what we call buy better. The typical example is electricity. You can buy green electricity or uh, electricity from coal. No, but uh, this is just one example among the others. And uh, uh, the third one is make economic sense. So because whichever strategy has to make sense also economically. I'm not saying savings by definition, but at least not uh, a hurdle in terms of uh, cost barriers. Um, a little bit of advertising. So this is how the smart drum looks like. Uh, this is a project we are carrying out with Ital Progetti. Uh, the, the drum, uh, while working, is collecting all the data from, uh, of consumption of water, electricity, whatsoever, that are needed to carry out an LCA analysis of that process. And uh, uh, in this computer, there is a software that has been developed uh, by Fabio and our colleagues uh, um, to simulate, to carry out the so-called what if. What if uh, I reduce a little bit the use of chemicals? Uh, what if uh, I change that chemical with the other? What if I reduce the running time and blah, blah, blah. So by doing these simple questions uh, to themselves, 
technicians are able to understand and valorize and quantify the reductions in terms of money and environmental impact. Then they are able to run the process as they have modified it, and if the ladder comes out as it should, then a potential improvement has been made. Okay, so this is a machine that is meant only to be in the R&D department, it's not meant for full production, we're working on the full production scale, but for monitoring purposes, not for process development. Um, and this is exactly the, uh, the uh, kind of example of how the data structure looks like, uh, by I am just saving you the boring part of uh, people making all the different assumptions, but in this case, for example, we see that there has been a steady reduction in total time in chemical dosage, and this, of course, has been uh, reflected in a reduction of costs and of uh, quantities of chemicals, for example. Okay, so this is a, a full set of, integra of integrated integrators that is allowing technicians uh, to take decisions. This software, technician, the managers of companies, they love it. The technicians, they hate it. Uh, so the last part is uh, related to uh, compensation. Um, I don't know if any of you has already gone through a potential project of uh, carbon offsetting or insetting, but basically whenever you have an impact, you also have a potential cost of compensation. It's clear, no? If I, have, if I am emitting 100 uh, tons of CO2, then uh, I, can, uh, I, I am in the need, uh, if I want to compensate all of them, to pay a certain amount of money times 100. So the higher the impact, the higher the cost of compensation. Hmm? So if the concept here is very simple, implementing a, a reduction strategy leads to a reduction of the cost of compensation and potentially, hopefully, if done properly, to an increase of uh, the cumulative savings until the point where these two lines are matching one each, with each other, so that you could pay your compensation with the savings. Is that the moment to compensate? Not yet. The moment to compensate is when this line is basically horizontal, when your potential to compensate uh, is uh, uh, not anymore exploitable. Okay. Uh, and this is the end of our journey to be able to define with customers uh, customized roadmaps like this that are taking into consideration all the variables possible to make it doable at the level of uh, single companies. Uh, that was my last slide. I hope you, uh, I, I was not too fast, but uh, I think I was in my 30 minutes. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.